study. This morning, we come to Philippians chapter 1. In 2004, um, an advanced pediatric surgeon named Andrew Chong um, was in the fight for his life um, dealing with cancer. Um, he was a pediatric surgeon that had developed many different types of orthopedic braces for legs and for feet and for ankles for children. In fact, um, he has several uh, devices that are named after him that are used around the world to this day. He was born in Singapore, came to the United States in 1973, had a wonderful wife and five children, and uh, he was an elder at College Church um, in Wheaton, Illinois. When suddenly he was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, uh, the cancer uh, had multiple different effects in his body, and at 54 years of age, he went through surgery after surgery um, and eventually went to a, an emergency surgery where it looked like he would not survive um, at all. And so that night, the doctor called the family and said, you all need to gather. We cannot stop his bleeding this young 56-year-old doctor, that's very young um, in my opinion, this young 56-year-old doctor was dying. He went through a long procedure, and when the anesthesia finally wore off, his heart was in the midst of kind of having an ongoing heart attack, and he was in great pain, and he could not talk. And he knew that death was coming. As the family was gathered around, he started making some motions with his hands, and they were trying to figure out what he was motioning for. They couldn't, they couldn't quite get it. And eventually, somebody said, oh, he wants a pen. He wants a pen. And so someone grabbed a pad of paper, and they gave him a pen. And he began to write these words. He couldn't write in a long pattern. He could only write straight down because um, he didn't have good control. But he wrote these words. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then for a long time, he wanted to write something else, and they were trying to figure out what it was, and he was hesitating, and he would start, and then he would stop, and he would start, and he would stop. Over a minute it took him, and finally he wrote this word. Hallelujah. Here was a man who the impulse of his heart, when death was at the door, was, de was absolutely declaring his hope in Christ. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Hallelujah. Which means praise be to God. Now, the amazing thing is, is that that man survived that night, but he didn't survive the next week. He went to be home with the Lord. But as we think about Dr. Andrew Chong and his life and what was the impulse of his heart, and as we see the legacy that he lives, leaves behind, we see that the glorious salvation of God at death's door was his grand and beautiful hope. Notice with me that the sermon last week, as we looked last week, the title was Reason to Rejoice Christ is Proclaimed. Paul was rejoicing because Jesus was being proclaimed, even if it was by his enemies. This morning, we come to Reason to Rejoice in life and in death that we can rejoice in life and in death. So we move on to a new section, and as we do, I want us to review just a moment, and much of this is the same. There's two added things in both of these first sections. First of all, the review. For those of you who are new to us this morning, maybe you've, you're picking up right here in the middle of our study in Philippians. In part, we do this for you so that you can know exactly where we are, and this will make more sense. So just kind of notice here, we're reading a letter that is written by Paul to a group of people at a city called called Philippi. 
They're called the Philippians. It's the Philippian church. And so, number one, Paul writes from a prison in Rome to the Philippian church. He planted, he planted this church, and he loved this church. He loves them very much. And it's said in the early part of Philippians how much he loves them. Number two, Paul awaits execution, and the Philippians endure much what? trouble. So it's not just Paul that's experiencing trouble, but the Philippian people are experiencing trouble, and that's part of the reason he's writing to them. And their troubles um, are many, as we've just sung. Um, their troubles are many, and there's troubles um, that are all around us. There were in that day, and there are in this day. Number three, Paul wants them to know that he's truly okay, and that God is powerfully using his persecution for his grand plan in kingdom advancement. That's part of the reason he's, he's writing to them is that he is, he is seeking to assuage their fear and cause them to see that God is in it all. Number four, and this is a new one, and we see this from last week, Paul rejoiced that the gospel was being preached even if it was by people who were doing it for the wrong motives. And not just the wrong motives, but even the wrong motives that were seeking to hurt him. So last week we looked at the fact that there's some people who preach the gospel for the wrong motives. But what we also saw was is that the gospel message is so powerful that even when preached for the wrong motives, it still has its power, life-changing effect. And so God is working and moving even amidst those who are getting the gospel right but for the wrong reasons. So though in prison, Paul is rejoicing in some things. Last week, we looked at three of them. Today, we add one more. So these are, there's 16 times we see the word rejoice or joy shows up in this letter. But notice this. Number one, he had the opportunity to preach the gospel to his captors. He was happy about that. Number two, he's preaching in prison. His preaching in prison emboldened other believers to boldly preach the gospel who were not in prison. And so they would see, if he can do that in prison, we can do that out here. So people were being encouraged. Number three, the gospel is being preached all the more, even by those against him, as we just said. He's rejoicing in that, and he explicitly said that in the text last week. Well, number four is where we come today. Whether he lives or dies, the salvation of God is his sure hope. Whether he lives or dies, the salvation of God is his sure hope. And we want to look at this, and we're really going to look at just the top part of this scripture today. Next week, we will go on for 22 and on down through 26. But today, we're going at the end of verse 18 um, and verse 19, 20, and 21. Notice what it says at the top of the page in the box. He says, yes, I will rejoice For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all, I will not be at all ashamed. For that with, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body." in my body, whether by death, by life, or by death. Look at verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, next week, we're going to keep on going, but for this is where we want to stop this week. Let's read verse 21 out loud together. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, it's interesting that that passage 21 and that phrase right there is really kind of in the middle of this entire paragraph and this entire thought. And it's really the anchor for all that we're going to see this morning and our next message on this next Sunday morning. So it's the picture that to live is to be in Christ and to die is gain. But let's, let's go back and let's look and let's see some key observations from this text. And the first part we want to see is that first phrase, and if you would, underline it up there. Um, he says, yes, I will rejoice. Now, especially underline, I will rejoice. Put a circle around the word rejoice. Here we see the word rejoice at the end of verse 18, and take your pen and go all the way down to verse 25 and circle the word joy in the face. Circle the word joy. 
So you have rejoice up in the top um, of this paragraph, and you have joy at the bottom of it. These are bookends that are really helping us see the, the emphasis that is on joy here. And it's very interesting because, as we've said, Paul is, is chained to a Roman guard. He is not free. He is in prison. And he has people that are even antagonizing him on the outside from his own team. Christians themselves antagonizing him. And then we also see that he is writing to people who are struggling. And yet, all the way through this letter, we see that there is a joy that overrides all of this. The entire scene, whether on Paul's end or on the Philippian end. And thus, the reason for this title even this morning is the reason to rejoice. Here we see that Paul is rejoicing. Now, how is he rejoicing? Number one, Paul's rejoicing is a response of faith. It is a response of faith, not an emotional reaction. Now, this is important to us because in this day and time, when we think about joy, we often equate joy with happiness. We often equate joy with an emotional sense, an emotional feeling, and it usually is equated in such a way that it's a reaction. It's a reaction to circumstances. But when we get to see who God is and what He is doing in a fallen world with His people that He's calling out of the Old Testament and out of the New Testament time and even to this present time, we see that God's people in this world are are given the glorious perspective that they are not bound by the trouble of this life, but they are promised with the great promises of salvation and redemption in every way that God has ordained. And so our joy is not bound by the circumstances of this life. Look what he says there, and in fact, even what is not in the box on the page, here we see at the top in the box of the page, it says, yes, I will rejoice. The phrase that is just before that is, indeed, he says, I rejoice, and that is at the end of the text last week. So there's actually twice that is stated here, and that's kind of what gives the translators a little bit of a clue that a new subject is coming, a new emphasis is coming in the text. You know, the the Greek language, and especially Greek ancient texts, they are not broken down with separated paragraphs, and there's no numbers like this. These numbers were added by a Frenchman a thousand years later. Um, So the numbers are only there added by scholars of the Bible to help us be able to identify areas that we're studying, be able to go to it. Um, Those were not originally there. In fact, the paragraph breaks were not even there. So we have to figure out by the nature of the text and by the subject matter and even the syntax of how the Greek was written of when there's kind of a page, a, a thought break. Well, one of the clues of that is the fact that he says, I will rejoice, and then he says, yes, I will rejoice. And he's going on to a new, a new thought in that. And that's why this is an appropriate paragraph that we would look at. So he says, yes, I will rejoice. And this is the idea that it's not filled in. It's not automatic. We see the words there, I will. It's not, it's not the idea of, of I'm just responding to this. It, this is a decision that he's making. It's not automatic. It's not involuntary. You know, there's certain things that if you put it in front of a five-year-old, suddenly they're happy. I mean, you, you put, you know, a great big thing of frozen yogurt with candy all over the top of it or whatever it is in front of a five-year-old, suddenly they're, they're, they, a big smile comes across their face. Um, there's certain things that we do that it's just, it's kind of involuntary. It just happens. That's not what we're talking about here. We see in Paul's statements here from prison, he's saying, I will rejoice. You see, we also see that it's not circumstantial because his circumstances are not happy circumstances. The circumstances that he's in are actually rather dire. You see, fill this in. True joy does not come from our circumstances, and very important, but from God's salvation. This is where true joy comes from. 
And we, we, this, this, this entire paragraph is shouting this to us. Look what it says up there in the top. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. This is talking about salvation. Now, don't turn the page over. Look at Psalm chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. This is a beautiful picture of what we're saying, that our, our circumstances aren't where the joy comes from. It comes from God's salvation. Look what verse 7 says. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. You see, it is that God puts joy in our heart. It's not that the grain and the wine abound, so the, the joy is coming from abounding circumstances. That's the picture here of the psalmist is writing about glorious circumstances. Look at the next verse in verse 8. It says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Now think about that with me. Look what it says. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. When, under threatened circumstances, if you're, if you're out in the wilderness or you're maybe a soldier in battle or you're a family member pioneering something or maybe you live in a town that has a lot of security troubles and it's time, you know, the sun goes down, it gets dark, and then that's very often when thieves or that's very often when trouble would come. That's very often when an enemy would attack. But notice the difference here. He says, in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you, look what it says, you alone, you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. This is about the salvation of God. That you, it's not anybody else that does this, but ultimately it is the picture. And the Bible is always pointing us to the picture that salvation and security belongs to God. And as Christians come to realize and Christians come to embrace that their salvation, their security, their hope, their joy is in Christ, they come to see the, the plan of God's salvation and God's goodness throughout the Scripture. Notice number two, and fill this in, and we see this as well as we go to um, the next verses here, 19 through 20, but look what it says. Paul's confident faith, so he has confident faith. He's saying, I will rejoice, for I know. You see that in verse 19 up there at the top, for I know. So he has confident faith. Paul's confident faith was fueled by the prayer of people and the power of God. Look what it says in verse 19. For I know that through your prayers, he's writing to the Philippian people, he's saying, you've been praying for me, and God has been answering your prayers. He's saying that I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my, what does it say? Deliverance. And that's talking about a salvation. That's a, that the, the word comes from soteria, or the, our soteriology is the study of salvation. This is, this is the salvation of his Now, is Paul talking about the fact that he's going to be rescued out of a Roman prison? Is he going to be rescued from being beheaded? Or is he talking about his eternal salvation, the salvation of his soul? Well, there's ambiguity in that. We don't know which one he's talking about. We, we get hints that he maybe even wanted us to wonder because he recognizes he doesn't know all things. He doesn't know all that God has in store. It appears that he is confident that he's going to be released. It appears that he's seen, I'm called as an apostle to preach the gospel. God is, going to, is God is going to get me out of this so that I can go on preaching the gospel? But we see here that that's his glad assumption because of time after time after time that God has delivered him from those circumstances. But to our knowledge, God did not deliver him from this Roman prison. To our knowledge, it was that it was at this time that eventually led to his death. But what we see is his glad confidence in the Lord, and he sees that confidence as coming from the prayers of his brothers and sisters around him and the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a huge commentary for us this morning. If you are struggling in this life, 
to, to walk with God and to walk in this life in such a way that your life is not torn to shreds by yourself or by others or by the circumstances around you. Listen, you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You need Christian community. You need those who will call out your case before God. I need you to pray for me as a pastor. I need you to pray for one another as a pastor. If, this is a beautiful thing. And, you know, we've kind of been through kind of a pastor appreciation month. We, we, we try not to make a real big... We, as pastors of this church, we feel like every month um, is pastor appreciation month. I mean, we have just got the greatest church in the world. But many of you have written cards to Pastor Lucas and me and, and Pastor Jason and others. And we just... We just love this beautiful relationship between Paul and the Philippian church. Just kind of like between the, the pastors of this church and the leaders of this church, many of you so appreciate your Sunday school teachers and your, your youth workers and others that you look at that and you just say, man, what a, what a beautiful relationship this is called to be. And that's what we see in this as we pray for one another and as we care for one another, this is playing into Paul's confidence. Notice this and fill in this first dot that is there. God's sovereign plan includes God's people asking and him answering. He is so sovereign in all things. He leads us to ask and he is working and answering those prayers for his glory. We are privileged to come, be moved of his spirit, to be obedient to his call, that we pray for one another, that we pray for his glory to be known, and that he is glad to answer that. And this is all a picture of his sovereign plan. He's in control of all things, even moving us toward prayer. And we get to have the privilege of participating in his plan. You know, if you're not one who prays for others, if you're not one who prays for the circumstances around you, I just want to say that that's, that's very concerning. I mean, true Christians pray. I want to encourage you. It, it, let that be a challenge. You, ooh, I want to, I want to look and see, am I Am I honoring the Lord with my life in this? I, I want to be a part of what he's doing. Maybe even right now he's prompting you to say, yes, become a man, become a woman of prayer. Enter in with his plan in this. And I believe that, that God will lead you to pray. God will lead you to become a person of prayer involved with his plan. Notice the second part that is in here, that God's sustaining power is supplied by his Holy Spirit. We see that in verse 19. Look at verse 19 at the top. It says, for I know that through your prayers, and then look what it says, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, we, we, we look at this. The, the word help actually right out there to the side of the box, supply. That's the actual word, the supply. Um, that, that you're, the, the supply that I'm going to get, the, the strength that I need, the provision that I need is going to come from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We, we don't usually see the Spirit of Jesus. In fact, that's the only place where we see this exact term of the Spirit of God, but it's clearly a reference to the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, um, this picture of, of Christ in spirit. We know that God is one, hero of Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Father, Son, and Spirit. And here we see that he is sending his Holy Spirit to supply the power. In Acts chapter 1, it, in verse 8, we see this very clearly um, back at Pentecost. For the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying um, that the Holy Spirit is going to come. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's this sustaining power that we see here. Not only do we see God's sovereign plan and sustaining power, but we also see in this, and it's, it's kind of here in a subtle way and it's beautiful, we also see here God's holy word. And God's holy word informs our faith. We see that this is part of the reason that the apostle Paul is confident. Now, I want you to underline just a few words that are here, and it's important that you see this. Underline the words up in the box, up there at the top, in verse 19, it says, turn out for my deliverance, or will turn out for my deliverance. When the apostle Paul 
includes that phrase in this letter he is quoting from the Old Testament. He is quoting, in fact, not just any random verse from the Old Testament. He's quoting a key verse from the Old Testament, a key theme, a key section of the Old Testament. And it's from that incredible letter of Job or the account of Job's life. He's going back to really the key theme in all of the book of Job. Look at Job chapter 13 and verse 16. You see it there. I've underlined it on your outline there. This will be my salvation. And I've put in brackets out there, deliverance. That is the, it's, it's really the same word. The translators, the English translators um, uh, adapted it in this. They, they have to choose between salvation and deliverance. That's what one they chose in one versus the other. But here we see Paul pulls out a phrase that any Jewish reader reading this would understand the word of God is informing his faith. The word of God is encouraging him. In fact, in verse 15, that's just above that, and I've put it on the outline, it says, look in Job chapter 13 and verse 15, it says, though he slay me, I will trust in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. And it's not a disrespectful thing. He's saying, I will present to God my faith in him. And this is the picture. This will be my salvation, my deliverance, that the godless shall not come before him. And what Job is saying is that God rescues the righteous. And God has given him righteousness through faith in ultimately the coming Messiah, that he would be made righteous. And he's saying, God will not accept the wicked, but he has promised to accept the righteous. And that is Job's statement of faith, that though he slay me, I'm going to trust in him because I know that he rejects the wicked and he accepts the righteous. And the big picture is the only way that we can be made righteous is through the Messiah of Jesus. And that's what Paul, excuse me, that's what Job was pointing to, and Paul ultimately is pointing to this. That's a, a huge theme in this. But I want us to see this morning that the Word of God, the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures were on Paul's heart. The reason Paul had confident faith is because he knew the Old Testament, and he knew God's promises, and he saw the fulfillment of God's promises in this Lord Jesus Christ, who he met on the Damascus Road. And so he would live his life in confident faith because he knew what God had said and God had done a work in his heart bringing the Scripture to life in him. So his sovereign plan, his sustaining power, his holy word, and then look at the next one there. Paul had confident faith because of God's salvation promise makes even death of little consequence to the recipient, to the recipient of that promise. Even death is of little consequence. Look what he says in verse 20. This is beautiful. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all, that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. Look what it says, whether by life or by death. Now, there's some really, really beautiful language here where he's talking about this, this salvation promise of God, that God is going to save him. Even if he, if he goes through the valley of the shadow of death, that he's going to ultimately be saved. Now, that, that phrase, eager expectation, you see, we, we see Paul is eager about this. It's beautiful. It means an outstretched neck. And here's the idea. Just look at me for a second. I'm kind of strange. It's, it's the... That's what he's doing. It, it's when you're eagerly waiting for something. You're eagerly looking for it. You know, it's the, it's the guy that's waiting for the ball to be passed. It, it's, the, it's the person that's waiting. And he's, you know, he's, he's there and he's, he's eagerly stretched out his neck. That's actually what the Greek says. It's the expectation with a stretched neck. And not only with a stretched neck, but also eyes that are fixed. So it's the intense look. 
It's the intent. It's waiting for it. Friends, that is the expectation that Paul had of God's salvation. And that is why, even in prison, that is why after trial, after trial, after trial, for three decades, he had this glorious expectation that God was going to save him, that God was going to take care of them, that God was going to cause everything to eventually work out. This is a confident faith. And not only that, but we see the word that's hope there. Look up at verse 20. It says, as it is my eager expectation, and then look at the next word, and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. The word hope is used very differently in the New Testament than we use the word hope. In modern day, when we talk about hope, we are talking about a wishful hope. And here I've outlined this. This is not a wishful hope. It's not something that you just, you know, I wish upon a star and, you know, make a wish before you blow out the candle. You know, what do you wish for? What do you hope? For? What do you, that's how we use the word hope. But here we see in the New Testament that the hope of Christ is a sure hope. It's not a wishful hope. It is a certain, you can put that down. It is a certain hope. It is a hope that is based not upon circumstances, but based upon the promise of God. And God always delivers on his promise. And so we see that his confident faith is fueled and and is really lived out because of an eager expectation and a true, sure hope. And then what is that hope? Look what it says in verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. What he's saying is, I am fully confident that God is not going to leave me high and dry. God is not going to leave me looking like the idiot by not fulfilling his promise. God is going to fulfill his promise, and I am not going to be disappointed. That is the picture that is here. Not at all ashamed. Doesn't have to do with embarrassment. That's not the picture so much as it is you're not going to be disappointed. And so he's saying, but that, look at the verse again, not at all ashamed, but that with full courage, underline those two words up there, full courage, now as always Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. He's saying, If he sees me through, he's going to be honored. And if he takes me home, he's going to be honored. If I get released, he's going to be honored. Or if I don't get released, he is still going to be honored. My desire is to be faithful to him. Look at number three. For Paul, God's salvation promise made life or death a win-win. It doesn't matter for him whether he lives or whether he dies when it comes to being a success or a fail. Both are a success. Both are a win. You see, fill this in. In living, he would glorify God through serving Christ and his church. So we're going to see next week that he wants to live. He wants to live in the midst of his great great troubles and circumstances in order to serve Christ and to make him known. He wants to live for the sake of the Philippians and for the sake of other Christians. He wants to live for the sake of the lost. He would glorify Christ by serving him in the midst of the trouble. But in dying, he would finally worship God face to face. Paul is not not afraid of death, and it's the reason that he's not afraid of death is that he's taken God at his promise. You see, that's what faith is. My friends, there are many, many people that say, well, even Christians have to live in fear of death. I mean, do you really know? Do you really know? I want you to know. Look at the Lord's here and see testimony of Christians all through the ages. You can really know. You can have a glad and confident faith in what God has said, and you can go through the door of death with the faith that God is not a liar. We may lie. We may let people down. We may see other people may lie to us. Other people may make promises to us that are not fulfilled, but that is not God. And so the more we see who God is, we're going to see this in just a minute, but the more we see who God is and the more we come to know him and experience in this life, you can run through the door of death 
with the glad expectation, the eager expectation, and sure hope that God is going to deliver on his promise. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the reason he went to the cross for our sins. This is the reason that he rose from the dead to secure our victory in Christ. And that is what we are called to trust in and believe in. And I just want to say to you that the more that we walk with him, the more confident our faith can be. And that's what we see in the life of Paul. So encouraging us. Well, let's apply this for just a moment. Application encouragement. Number one, stop looking at your circumstances as the source of two things, as the source of your sorrow or the hope of your joy. You say, wait a minute, pastor, never heard that before. What do you mean? Stop looking at my circumstances, the source of my sorrow. I thought that's where all my sorrow comes from, my circumstances. If you only knew who I was married to, you'd know why I'm sad. I mean, come on, pastor. Da, 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 da. Oh, no, see, that's part of the problem. That's part of the problem is that you're, you're looking at the circumstances maybe of health, or you're looking at the circumstances of, of relationships or the circumstances of your finances or the circumstances of your family or your, you know, these various things. And you're saying, this is making me unhappy. This is the source of my sorrow. We have to, we're going to look at that a little bit. No, I would say to you, that's not the source of your sorrow. Look at the next part here. The, you need to stop making your circumstances the hope of your joy. We see that your joy is, is never going to be based in your circumstances. There's some people that are thinking, well, if I can just get this taken care of, or if, if this will just get worked out in my life or in my family or in my whatever it is, then I'll be happy. And I would say to you, no, notice this. Sorrow comes, so important, sorrow comes from putting anything before God in our hearts. That is the source of our sorrow. The source of our sorrow is when we look to anything instead of God for the hope of the heart. And this is sin. When Dave Sands prayed a few moments ago, part of his confession of our sin is idolatry. Some of you would say, well, I'm glad I don't struggle with idolatry. Um, I don't have a graven image at my house. I don't have a Buddha, or I don't have this, or I don't have that. I don't have it. No, you may drive your idol. I don't know. Or you may live in your idol. Or you may change the diaper of your idol. You may go spend nine to five at your idol, or 9 to 8, or 10, or 12 at your idol. My friends, we need to recognize that idolatry is what God will not accept. In fact, the first commandment is, thou shalt have, let's say it out loud together, thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other gods. And whenever we place something in front of him, we are raising it up as a totem, as a God that we are worshiping. So the source of our sorrow is when we are putting other things in front of God. I, Marcy and I have um, another young lady in our life um, that we love very much. Um, her name is Brittany Steigner. And recently, um, Brittany's mom was diagnosed um, with cancer that has spread throughout her body at just um, 58 years of age. And uh, she lives in St. Augustine, and I actually spoke with both of them yesterday. But a few, weeks, a few weeks ago, when I was talking to Brittany about how she's dealing with this, her father had died of alcoholism um, about 12 or 13 years ago. That was very, very hard for her. And then Brittany their first baby, she and Josh, he's a pilot for the Air Force, um, their first baby was born with Down syndrome. And, um, you know, that was a great shock and a great difficulty, and, and they kind of worked through that, and now they've, they've come to see all of the joy um, of their precious, precious baby, and they've had another baby that's completely um, whole without any, without any difficulty. But as she was saying, you know, losing dad 
and then the struggle and the difficulty of your first child and trying to come to grips with that. And now, here I am, and it looks like I may lose mom. Brittany was just very honestly saying to me, Andrew, I, I'm starting to realize that I can have idols around me that I'm putting in front of God. And some of those things can be good things, very good things, like a, a precious child or a precious parent. But Jesus calls us to forsake all other relationships and all other things and to put them behind the priority of God being first. And so he's, he's working that in our heart day in and day out. He's stretching us and refining us to look to him, to trust in him, to not put our children, to not put our parents, to not put our job, to not put our comfort, to not put our security, not put our leisure, not put our pets, not put anything in front of him. Because whenever we put other things in front of God. Number one, it is sin, and sin always brings sorrow. You see, the greatest way to enjoy your children are to enjoy them through the lens and the filter of honoring God. The greatest way to have confidence and to enjoy your parents and to care for your parents and to honor your parents is to do so in honoring God. God becomes the key and central figure for the worship of the heart. So we need to stop looking at our circumstances as the source of our sorrow or the hope of our joy. Instead, number two, we can be, or we can also, and akin with this, number two, we can be relieved, you can be relieved that Christian joy is not something you have to manufacture. You know, sometimes people say, just be joyful. You know, come on, look at the Apostle Paul. I will rejoice. Well, let me, we need to be careful with that because joy is something that God brings to us. And the, the picture is, as he brings to us this joy, it is his salvation in our life. You see, it will never come from you or anything in this world. Joy is not something that you have to come up with. God is the one who comes up with it, and he comes up and it brings it, he brings it to us through faith. Number three, we need to accept the reality that true joy only comes from God. True joy only comes from God. Now, some of you can say, well, now wait a minute, Pastor. I know people who do not know the Lord. They do not claim Christ. They may be um, just secularists, or they may be Buddhists, or they may be Hindus, or they may be uh, something else. And they, they, man, when the baby's born, they're joyful. They cry. They are thankful. Or maybe they're 65, 70, 80 years old, and their children are around them, and their grandchildren are around them, and they are joyful. And they, you know, you see them celebrating a birthday or a family reunion or something, and, and man, life could just never be better. And I would say, you know what? Those are all part of the grace of God in their life. Because God has made good things. God has made this beautiful thing of procreation that we get to enjoy the, the great privilege of that and see our children. Or God has given us the privilege of work with reward. God has given us the privilege of so many of these things that are really ultimately from God. But this is the picture that the true joy that comes for all time is ultimately the great picture of God working and moving in us through his salvation. So how can I have God's true joy? How can I have that? Number one, look to Christ for your only hope of salvation. This is where the true joy of God begins. Look for Christ as the hope of salvation. Believe and turn to him as your savior king. He is the Savior King that we rest in, that we hold on to. Not only look to Christ for your hope of salvation, but this is so important, and we see evidence of this in this text, is feast your mind and your heart on God's holy word. If you want the joy of God, you have to know all that he is and all that he's done. That's where it comes. Just fill that in. Learn all that it says that he is, and all that he has done. If you want God's joy, you come to the truth 
of God's great grace in Jesus Christ. You embrace it and you learn of it. You see, there's a lot of people, listen to this, there's a lot of people, don't turn your, these verses at the bottom, we're going to look at them real quick, so look at that. Here, here's what a lot of people do. They kind of hear a little bit about God, and maybe they even hear about the person of Christ, and they hear about salvation in Christ, and they, they gladly accept that. But somehow they continue on, maybe even in their Christian life, a life of genuine faith, but that is not feeding on God's Word. So their, their mind is not being transformed by the truth of God. They, they've never just come to realize that. And, you know, that's why we're doing the book Dug, uh, Dig Deeper, um, so that we can study God's Word, that, that we're learning how to read God's Word in a very basic way. It's very helpful. The guys have been just amazed at how helpful it has been just in their basic reading. And why do we do that? So we can learn who God is and what He has done. And this is where we see Paul so very blessed. But I want you to just see these beautiful promises. Maybe you're really struggling today. And maybe, maybe these verses, maybe some of, these, some of you would say, I've read those verses all my life, but maybe today in light of this message, you would read it afresh and anew. Look what it says in Matthew 6 in verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Now, the context around that is, are you worried about life? Are you worried about how tomorrow is going to be? Are you worried about having enough? Jesus is dealing with that very issue, and he says, you know, when you're worried about having enough, when you're worried about all these things, you seek God. You remember his righteousness, and you're going to have everything you need. Look at the next one. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In fact, let's read this out loud together. Everybody um, get ready to read. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding." In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your street, your paths. Look what it says. Trust in the Lord with what? All of your heart. Put him first. Don't lean on your circumstances. Don't lean on your understanding. And look at the next part, verse 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That doesn't mean just, you know, oh yeah, he's there. In all your ways means that that you take what he has said about life and you, you, put it to, you put it into practice. You acknowledge what he has said. And when you do that, your paths are going to be straight, as opposed to what? A crooked path. It's wandering along and bouncing like a pinball in a pinball machine from pillar to post. We can experience God's grace. Now, I love Psalm 37 and verse 4, and we end with this. Look what it says. Delight. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. You see, put above the word there, delight, worship. That's what this is talking about. Worship the Lord. And maybe put below, the, give you the desires of your heart, true joy. Because it's not about just getting, you know, when I read that as a kid, I thought, great, I get a go-kart, <laughs> mini bike. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Over in the other building, I remember the day um, a Sunday school class was being taught, second floor of the gym building over there, the, uh, I think we call it the, the D building now, um, the activity center up there in one of those classrooms. And I remember studying this on a Sunday school, and I just thought, man, I got a delight in the Lord. That's how you get a mini bike. That's how you get a go-kart. You know, that's what, you know, 10-year-olds think about. Um, and, and so, no, 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 no. So far greater than a mini bike or a go-kart, you get God. And you get all of the things that God promises, which is so much better than the things of this life. You get eternity in your heart. Everybody, pack up close up, and then when you're done, look up here. (laughs) 
I want you to think about what we've just studied. Think about this thought. Your true joy is never going to be found in your circumstances. Because you can have the best this world has to offer and be as miserable as anybody else. In the same hand, you can have very, very difficult circumstances. But if the salvation of God is your great joy and your great hope, it doesn't get any better than that. The Apostle Paul is writing chained to a Roman soldier. The Apostle Paul is, is bound and kept and not in a circumstance of freedom. And he's writing to people who are hurting. And he's saying to them, I will rejoice. And it's not fake. It's simply that he sees the big picture. The question is, do you see the big picture? Friend, the greatest way for you to have joy is to stop and worship God. Tomorrow, as part of the Monday message, I'm going to put an Irish praise song at the beginning of the Monday message. And it'll be a video with some lyrics. It's by Robin Mark, done probably 15 years ago. But it so captures this. This week when Pastor Jason and I went to see Vivian Hewlett, this faithful woman of God in our church, and as we were talking about the shock of having cancer, ovarian cancer, Mrs. Hewlett, she doesn't mind me saying, she's 81 years old. She would say, I've lived a good full life. I have five wonderful children. I have eight grandchildren. I have nine great-grandchildren. I have two brothers who love me. I, I have all of these blessings, but she would say, the greatest blessing of all amidst the shock of this is that God is in control. And here's what she quoted. She quoted from Isaiah, and she said, what do you do when the spirit of heaviness comes, when the spirit of trouble comes, when the cloak of burden is laid on your shoulders? She said, I put on, actually, the garment of praise. I begin to delight myself in the Lord. I begin to seek first the kingdom of God. I begin to acknowledge him in all my ways. And he brings the joy of his gladness amidst the circumstances of life. Friends, I, I think that for us, as we go through trouble, we need to stop and worship. We need to stop and worship. We need to remember what his word says. We need to adore him for who he is, recognize who he is and what he's done. We need to bathe ourselves in his joy of promise and hope. This is the way you make it through the great disappointments in life. This is the way you make it through chained to a Roman soldier. This is the way you make it through a letter from the IRS. <laughs> May we put on the garment of praise. Would you stand together?